Thank you. We'd love to have you join. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to hang out for a few minutes here. All right, guys. So thank you so much for being here uh, tonight. This is a topic that's very important to me. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, triathlon is something that's been part of my life for 26 years. It started when I was 10 years old. And uh, I really enjoy just the lifestyle of triathlon and multi-sport for those 26 years. It's something that I'm really passionate about is introducing new people to the sport, um, introducing uh, people to my passion. And uh, so we're, we're, I'm thrilled that you're here and uh, can, can give you a little bit of information. And uh, we're going to keep this fairly informal. And so we have some questions along the way. Let's just have a discussion and we can, we can work through and I can go into different tangents and answer some more questions uh, at the end. Cool? So, guide to your first uh, first triathlon. I thought it was important to start on why triathlon? Why, why, why would you even do this uh, crazy thing? And there's a few things as I've looked back over the last 26 years and, and watched, uh, watched the sport evolve that made triathlon really special uh, to me and why um, it's so easy to share it with other people and, uh, and invite them into it. So, one, it is a great way to get in stage shape. And that's, that's what I always tell people. Number one, I, I, I know would not do well just going to the gym to just sit on the treadmill just to be on the a treadmill to get in shape. I need a goal. I'm, I'm competitive and I want, I, I want to know that on this day, I've got to be able to perform my best. Nothing does that better for me than, than triathlon. For a lot of people, it's like a bucket list item. Right? It kind of it kind of scares you a little bit. It's a, a little bit of adventure um, in it, and uh, that draws a lot of people, and that gets them uh, committed to this goal, gets them out of bed because because they know they've got to do this thing that's it's tough and uh, it's important to them, and I, I, so therefore I think it's just a a great way to get and stay in shape, and the goal just gets you moving. Um, the there's a great benefit. In training three different disciplines that use muscles differently and all develop the heart and lungs very, uh, very much the same. And it's uh, when we look at that like, single sport, we see a lot of runners oftentimes come into triathlon uh, to be uh, to, to be able to experience competition and be able to experience endurance but in a way that it's a little bit less pounding on their body. Um, now we're huge advocates, and even in the running world, if you're really into pure running, to still use cross training and, and in that, and so you can still kind of adopt the multi-sport uh, lifestyle, but maybe you're predominantly racing um, running as well. So I think there's, there's value in it, even if you're not gonna be training, training triathlon all together. Come on in. <laughs> Um, you'll find that compared to a lot of sports communities out there, triathlon is a very welcoming, very encouraging community. And um, to a lot of people, they see they see Iron Man, then it kind of seems like this really intimidating kind of thing. It's very intimidating sport to be able to get into, but it's very much different than that. It is one of the most inviting, encouraging, uplifting communities um, out there. And I just encourage people to come out and experience that because once they experience that, they're super excited about it and they realize and they just jump in. Uh, it's super accessible. So again, one of the biggest misconceptions about triathlon is that they see someone sees Iron Man and they think that's all there is to triathlon. What they don't know is you can essentially almost find a triathlon in season every single weekend in the state of Virginia. There are tons of triathlons uh, across the country, and specifically, tons of triathlons that are short, less than an hour, or an hour, around an hour race. And so it's super accessible, it's something that anyone can kind of jump into and, and get involved in, uh, much like the running scene has been for years and years. And uh, so it's, it's really easy to kind of jump in and get, get going. There is a ton of variety of triathlon. So you don't have to just do uh, a road, swim, bike, run. There is a duathlon, run, bike, run. 
There is an aquathon swim, swim run. There is now um, the whole swim run series that's kind of taking over, over the country. There's off-road racing. There's adventure racing that's kind of fits within multi-sport. It's just tons of different opportunities. So even you might enter in the triathlon, you do a sprint triathlon, but then you decide, hey, for this season, I want to do off-road. For this season, I want to do swim run. Or this season, I want to do long course. This season, I want to do short course. And they're very much different. So it keeps the variety um, kind of in there, which really minimizes burnout, uh, which is uh, another huge thing with triathlon. There's just a ton of variety. You're not doing the same thing each day. And then it's unique. That was the big thing that I loved when I was 10 years old and got into sport. I loved that no one else was doing it that, that I was in school with. Uh, I, was, I was completely unique. Uh, you know, I was playing other sports, but triathlon was kind of my thing and no one else was really doing it. Now, obviously, the sport has come leaps and bounds since then. We had youth national championships and all kinds of uh, races all around, but still, it's still a unique thing, and it's something that people aspire and, and, and aspire to, and therefore um, that that's special for people and uh, really exciting. So I love the sport, I love the community, I love the atmosphere, I love what it does for you, I love how it impacts lives, and that's why I'm in this business. That's why I do what I do uh, because because uh, I've seen how it impacts lives uh, with different people as well as with my that we work with. So, before I jump into the slides, I said this before I, before, before I went, but I'm going to be giving you, like, we're going to be going over a lot of topics. Each of these topics, I have probably, or one of my staff members has spoken on at length, one, two hour lectures on. And what I've done is I've hit kind of the essentials, and we're going we're gonna to hit them kind of quick and dirty. All right, and then if you guys want any additional information on any of these various topics, um, like picking an event or training or picking the right equipment, reach out to me because I probably have the information and can, can send it out to you and get you a little bit more details on that. But my, my goal with this is with the beginner in mind to give you enough information so, so that you can complete your first sprint triathlon successfully and that you kind of know how to take this information and kind of take the next steps. So, so that's the plan with tonight. So picking an event is where we're going to start. We're going to go over a bunch of these different topics, most of them on one or a few slides each. And then, uh, and then at the end, we can dig into them a little bit more if y'all are interested in a specific topic um, more than others. So picking an event, the most important thing, any goal, is to go out there and pick that, that this becomes the goal. This is our end goal. So a lot of people get into the track and they're like, well, I'm going to kind of test this out, and then I'll kind of decide you know, what I'm going to do. Pick the race. Pick the race. Have the motivation. Put yourself on the line right from the beginning. Go out there and find the event that motivates you, excites you, challenges you a little bit, and go ahead and put it on the calendar and put your money down. Um, that's going to be a huge motivator as you start to kind of move, move through this. Now there's all types of distances out there, all right? So there's sprint distance, even shorter than that. There's this thing that, uh, that we, we also have called a super sprint distance, but, but sprint distance is a little bit more common, all right? And then there's international distance. Also, you might hear that called the Olympic distance, all right? There is the half Ironman distance, and there's an Ironman distance. Now, these almost double, sort of, as they kind of go up, but a typical sprint distance is a 750 meter swim, a 20K bike, and then a 5K run, all right? Now, oftentimes, you'll get a full sprint, uh, sprint triathlon that'll be a 300 meter swim, or a 400 meter swim, that cuts that down a little bit shorter. And then, Olympic distance jumps up to a uh, 1. Uh, well, 1.5K or 1,500 meter swim, a 24.8 mile bike, and then a 10K at the end, so a 6.2 mile run. Obviously, with each race, you might get a little bit of variations, but that's your, that's your standard distance. Half Ironman is a 1.2 mile swim, a 56 mile bike, and then a half marathon. 
and then Ironman is double that, 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then marathon at the end, 26.2 mile run. Super sprint distance takes the sprint distance and cuts that in half. So it's down around that 300, 375 meter swim, and then six mile bike, and then one and a half mile run. So that's the, the standard, that's the standard triathlon distances. With that said, there's tons of different variations, again, to triathlons and swim run and all, all kinds of things that are out there. Now, we're huge proponents here at North Fitness to start with small. So we get a lot of athletes that come to us, um, and it's very normal. I've got a bucket list item. It's Iron Man. I'm signed up for Iron Man. I'm going for it. It's kind of one and done oftentimes. Uh, but what, what we try to encourage people to do is really master the distances. Learn how to race a spread, then move into the international distance, then move into long courses, start racing some halves and Ironman. Because there's a lot of value in learning the, the how to race, not just complete. So when you, when you spend some time in each distance, you learn how to fully expend energy over that duration. Longer distance is no different, it's just expending the same amount of energy over a longer period of time. That's all, all racing is. We want to we spend all of our energy and empty it on that finish line. And so, spread distance, just as hard, it's just a different kind of intensity. A lot of people like longer distances because it's, uh, because it's a little bit more comfortable. It's spread over a longer period of time. So there's value in all of them, and there's a ton of value in really mastering a distance before moving on to the next one, because there are foundational uh, things that you learn in each distance that you can take into the next one and really build on. So we encourage people to start small. There, um, you'll find there's uh, one of the big differences out there is whether you're going to choose a pool triathlon or a open water triathlon most uh most most of the pool triathlons are going to be um, sprint distance triathlons or super sprint distance triathlons you're not going to find many if all any uh international half ironman or ironman distance pool triathlons but pool triathlon um there is uh, some, some value in that if you're uncomfortable in, in the open water, if you're uncomfortable with the swimming. Most of these pool triathlons, you can, you can walk the whole way if you want. It's, it's, very, it's a very comfortable environment. Uh, it's a time trial start, so it's not a mass start. You don't have tons of people all over you, just one at a time. And uh, it's a great place for a beginner triathlon to really get, or a triathlete to really, really get started. Whereas in open water, it's going to be a mass start. We'll be talking about that a little bit more um, a little bit later. I told you there's tons of different race opportunities in the in the Virginia area. Here are um, some big ones, especially in um, Richmond. Some different opportunities that you have uh, to, to race. So the BTS MTS series is, is by far the biggest series. Um, they started in Virginia, expanded. To, um, to Maryland, now they just have moved into uh, Pennsylvania and in Delaware as well. And if you go there, you'll see crazy amounts of races almost every weekend. So there's tons, tons out there. Go to 11 uh, Racing is a, a local company. They have a couple local um, triathlons here, um, as does VTS MTS. VTS MTS actually partners with RTC to put on the RTC spread. Um, so that's one of our local races here in Richmond. Um, Go to 11 has the Rovius Landing Triathlon as well as the Pink Power Triathlon, both here in the Richmond area. Um, so those are those are three races right there, right right in this Richmond area. Um, we put on the East Coast Triathlon Super Sprint. We uh, this is a whole triathlon festival uh, that happens on May 6. Uh, there's lots of things that happen. We have nine different races in one day. Uh, we have beginner races, very beginner-centric uh, races, which um, that's why we have that super spread distance. Uh, and, but we also have some of the top professionals in the world uh, travel in uh, to race uh, their race on that same day. So it's a really cool environment because you have beginners um, racing, and then later in the day you have the top professionals in the, in the world racing, 
And then uh, another part of the day, you have the top youth and junior uh, athletes in the country um, racing as well. And so it's just this really cool, long, long festival, and it's all day long, and it's a real cool thing for our, for our community. Um, great beginner race. And then we also have the Red 3 series. If you're familiar with Red 3, they, put, they started really putting on a lot of half Ironman and Ironman races. Now they're getting into more sprint races, mainly in Virginia. So there's a series of um, sprint races that our Red 3 puts on that are in our area, our surrounding area, um, a lot up in kind of the Fredericksburg um, area that uh, are out there as well. So tons of opportunities. All these are fantastic races, fantastic race series. Um, and I highly recommend them. All right, let's talk about equipment. Right? Now what I've done is I've built this down into two different slides. So I've built down, this is your, your bare essentials. And when I say bare essentials, I mean to get through the race, this is what you need. And then I go into uh, equipment upgrades. From here you can upgrade an infinite amount of times to buy speed as we call it. Uh, it really is, it's, it's buying speed. So start out any working bike. Uh, really, I mean that any working bike you can use in a, in a, in a travel bike, right? It's just you want it to be operating, uh, you want it to be working and to be safe, right? So you can use a mountain bike, you can use uh, a road bike that you just pulled out of your garage that's 30 years old, um, you can uh, use a triathlon bike. So all, all kinds of options there. Um, one big thing that I do recommend uh, or that they, they require is, on this it's not a good example, but on a road bike, one thing that kind of catches some beginners is when the bars come under, there's, uh, there's a bar in plug that kind of goes in the end of those, you need those. Now if you ever get to a race and those aren't in there, you can go to the mechanic that's on site and they usually have a huge bag of those and they can just give them out. Um, so just keep that in mind, always inspect your bike. If you've got a road bike, you've got to make sure those bar and plugs are in there because it's a safety issue. They, they tend to appeal people. They, I they, 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 they don't think it, but what he's saying is absolutely true. When I first started back in 2008 or something, I literally used my husband's mountain bike and I just simply put road tires on it. And that was my, and I, had, I didn't have clip ins, I just had the cages that you slide your tennis shoes in. And my husband was like, let's see if you really stick with this before we you know, go any further. And I did several races on that bike. And I had a guy ride by me one time and said, you know, if you have a really good bike, you might win this thing. You know, like yeah. I was just cooking on that mountain bike. So just to support yeah. what you're saying, you don't have to have a fancy bike, you can be intimidating. But Most people yeah. start there. Most people start on, on kind of the, whatever they can find in their garage, and then they, they get, get moving and get their first race under, under the belt. You need a good helmet. Uh, you, in, in that helmet, you need the CPSC sticker. Um, that's an important thing um, because oftentimes the officials go through a transition and they make sure that that CPSC sticker, which essentially means that it's it's been tested and that it's safe. Uh, it's just just to maintain safety. If you had a helmet that's like been in your garage for about ten years, I'd recommend getting a new one. They're not super expensive. And this is your head. You're talking about they do deteriorate over some time. Um, if you dropped it or have any kind of crash at any point, you go ahead and replace it. Again, they're not super expensive. It's just a, a good thing to have. Um, good running shoes with some kind of system on them so that you don't have to tie them. Now, there's tons of different things out there. There's elastic laces where you can just kind of slide your foot in. The easiest um, one is to just take a little cord lock like this, um, which you can usually get at a um, fabric store. Uh, and you just slide this onto like normal laces, and the very this is just the simplest way. You just zip it down. You kind of have your shoe your shoelaces tied at the uh, on the the front, and you just zip it down and it's tied. Um, what you don't want to be doing is getting into transition and having to sit there and tie your shoes for a long time. Um, so. I almost put that as not a bare essential because obviously you could just tie your shoe, but they're like 25 cents, so I'm just, I just put them in the bare essentials because I felt like it was just, it just saved some time there. Um, goggles, 
Now, I guess you could do the race without goggles. I actually didn't swim with goggles until I was 18, um, and I was a competitive swimmer, and I was afraid they'd always come off. But you, you don't, you don't need them. Uh, but there, most people, most people do enjoy having them. Uh, some kind of clothing that you can swim, bike, and run in. All right. Now, most people choose to do something like a tri suit where um, they can, it's kind of made for this, and you can swim, bike, and run all together. You don't have to put on anything else. Uh, I, some, some women will just wear a bathing suit, and that works just great. Just grab something out and go for it. Um, some, some guys will just wear like jammers that they might have for swimming, and they'll just go. Obviously, the, uh, when you have a tri-suit or a tri-specific uh, tri clothing, it is built for this, and it has a little bit of um, padding and anti-shaping uh, kind of built in uh, for because they've kind of anticipated that stuff, and so it's probably worth the investment, but not essential. Um, wetsuit. So if you're doing a pool swim, you won't need a wetsuit. Um, honestly, you don't need a wetsuit for any races. Uh, there, there is a level. I actually don't know what it is where they can make it mandatory, but it's really low. But typically, that's not going to be an issue. It's, it's that they, it can't be too warm, uh, where they will not allow you to wear it. Um, 78 is the limit for that. Uh, if, it's, if it's above 78, you still can wear a wetsuit, but you can't be eligible for the awards. And I think it's 82. If it's above that, it, you can't wear it at all. Um, they, they won't allow it because they're worried about heat shrink and, and, and different things like that. But a wetsuit will make you faster, it will make you a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and so it's a, it's a good thing to invest in. Um, you can also rent those. That's something that we do here. If you're looking to kind of just get, get, get through your first race, have figured it out, you rent a wetsuit and, and, uh, and, and be able to use it for that one day. Transition belt. This is another thing that isn't an essential item, but I felt like it's like an $8 item. It, it can save you a, a little bit of pay. Um, this is a transition belt right here. Uh, the number, your run number, which has to be on you on the run, just hooks right in here. If you're used to like a run, uh, run bib and for running races, same, same type of thing. And you just clip this on so when you get to transition, you don't have to like put on a shirt that has this because shirts when you're wet are kind of tough um, to do. Instead, you just grab this and while you're running out of transition, you snap it on. So it makes it a little bit quicker. Another little trick you can do is um, if, you're, if you're a guy and you're like wearing tri shorts, your jammer, you could safety pin that to the top and then tuck it down into your shorts. And then when you get out of the run, you can pull it out of the, of the shorts and then run from there. Um, that's another option that we do with some kids sometimes, uh, just to kind of keep things safe. But those are the bare essentials. Now, let's talk equipment upgrades. Now, I put some prices up here, and they're really uh, entry or my medium level prices, just kind of give you an idea. I'm also going to talk about the, um, the savings, the benefits of um, doing some of these things. Uh, that you can kind of move into and, and consider, is it, worth the, is it worth the investment? I would say, don't do this right for your first race. You don't have to do, uh, do that. Don't feel any pressure um, to do that. But once you kind of get there and you're, you race it, uh, one or two and you're like, hey, I want to get faster, here's an opportunity to kind of buy some speed uh, that's, that's out there. So cycling shoes and pedals. Uh, this is like, I've got here. Alright, so cycling shoes, there's a clip on the bottom, the clip hooks into your pedal, and now your foot is engaged with the pedal, and therefore you're able to pedal through 360 degrees of motion. Uh, this increases your efficiency, increases your, your power, and uh, just all around just makes you faster. Uh, and so, it's a great, great thing uh, to move into. Now, you can start the race, or start, start triathlon with, with just running shoes and flat pedals, no problem at all. That's how many of us started. Uh, but here's, here's an opportunity once you start to get into your, uh, a more efficient and more powerful uh, pedal stroke, those cycling, cycling shoes make a big difference. And you can get into um, those around $200. I would say you probably get into them at about $150 at, at the lowest, but on average around $200. Now that's Cleats, pedals, and, and shoes all, all together. 
The other thing that we highly recommend uh, is a bike fit. Um, and there's a lot of different um, reasons for this. I know that's not really an equipment piece, but what I've done is I've put them in the order that I would consider things, and a bike fit is the first thing that you should absolutely consider, especially if you are getting aero bars or you are getting on a tri bike, you want to take advantage of that. Now, the reason I say this is because 75% of your aerodynamics is your position. It's your body's position on the frame. 25% is the actual frame, right? The, the equipment that you're on. And so making sure that you're in the most aerodynamic position possible makes a ton of difference. The biggest savings in time that you're going to get is from a bike fit. And it's going to make sure it keeps you safer. It's going to make sure that you are more comfortable. Uh, so the, the, the benefits of getting professional fit it's just super, super important, so I, I can't recommend it enough. Beyond that, aero bars will be the next upgrade. So let's say you have a road bike. It's an old road bike. You're like, okay, how do I gain some more speed? All right? The next thing I would do is put on a little uh, set of clip-on aero bars. And they just clip on to your existing road bike. You don't have to have an integrated system like this tri bike, but just clip on your your road bike, and then we'll need to change your position slightly to be able to take advantage of them fully. Essentially, you're up like this, and we need to slide forward and come over the top. So that's how we get into a more aero, um, aerodynamic uh, position. An aero bar with a good fit taking advantage of the aero bar will save you about two minutes on average over a 40k an Olympic distance race. So if you're doing a sprint distance race, you're looking at about a minute. All right, the arrow bar is low. So you can kind of say, is it, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth that investment? This is where we kind of get into that game a little bit. So we see here, I meant to, I mean, use this picture a lot. So this is Cervelo team, right? They have, this is them on road bikes. And this is them on their time trial, or for them, it's a time trial bike, and triathlon, we call it a triathlon bike. You'll see just the frontal position, how much less is shown to the wind. Now, this is a more efficient position, and a more powerful position, but they are taking into consideration that they're going to be blind, they're going to be blocked from the wind a little bit, because they're going to be able, they're going to, be able to draft. They're, they're riding behind each other. Okay, they're in a pack, maybe they're climbing a mountain, aerodynamics aren't quite as essential. Here, they're in their time trial position, and they're going to get as tough and as low as possible, and it is a game of fighting against the wind. And so a lot of this equipment is allowing us to get into this position better. So, air bars, we can see air bars like this. This is a typical road, road setup. Um, air bar is about two minutes over a 40k. Aero helmet, it's amazing. You think, how can a helmet make a big difference? So we have we have a road helmet, all right. Lots of vents because the most important thing. We're not as much worried about fighting against the wind. We're going to be riding with others. Uh, we want to make sure we're just well ventilated. Um, so that's a that's a road helmet. And then an aero helmet, less vents in a shape that really foils the wind and takes it over top and down the back and, and really is trying to eliminate all the dead spots in, in the wind. And so, aero helmet will save you over 40k about, about a minute. Just by putting that helmet. It's crazy. I know it's crazy, but it will. And that's on average. Better helmet fit for you, make a bigger difference. You can just slap on an air helmet, and if it's not fit great for you, it's going to make a little bit less of a difference. So that's, a, that's an air helmet. Race wheels or um, a disc helmet, we'll talk about that. So race wheels, I've got kind of an in-between here. These are my training wheels, but they're, they've got a little bit of a deep uh, wheel, so they take a little bit more of um, aerodynamics. You see, uh, typically I race with a wheel that's about this deep and a full disc on the back. Uh, where it's completely locked in, uh, makes, a, makes a very big difference in terms of not creating wind. 
These almost act like an egg beater, where they're, they're kind of churning the wind. They create more resistance, uh, whereas, whereas my race wheels actually slide through the wind a, a, lot, a lot faster. So again, race wheels, you're looking at about a minute um, savings over, over a 40K on average. Uh, the, there is an option of a disc cover. It's about a $100 option. The, the, the full race wheel set is more like a $1,250 to a $1,500 investment, uh, but rate, a, rate, a, a disc cover is essentially you just take this wheel and you put a fairing over the top of it, and it costs about $100, and it gives you a disc wheel. There's a little bit of, it, it, for the most part, it's about as aerodynamic, not as the best disc wheel out there, but it's about as aerodynamic as an entry-level disc wheel. And so it's a good way to kind of get some speed without a huge investment. Um, a road or a drive on time frame. So I say road because if you've been on a mountain bike, a great upgrade is to move to a road bike. If you are on a road bike, a great upgrade is to move up to a track on bike. This is a track on bike here. A road bike would be a standard drop handlebars that they are riding there. So road bike, track on bike, in the cycling world referred to as a TT or a time trial bike. A little bit bigger of an investment. Usually, I'd recommend going through these on your road bike before you get here, unless you're just, hey, I'm all in with this. Just go ahead and get my track bike and get moving, all right? And then, lighter run, racing running shoes. Um, we, we refer to uh, racing flats. Uh, this would be something that you would only wear on race day or for some of your speed work. And these are just uh, typically in running, an ounce of savings in your running shoes, because it's less weight, typically uh, e equals about two seconds per mile. So you can kind of buy, you can, you can buy a lighter uh, shoe and then save some time in your running time. With that said, the, you have to be careful about that because you can go too light. Obviously, the lighter you go, the risk of injury kind of increases. So you want to you keep that in mind as you're, as you're doing that as well. All right. Let's get into some training. So this is an introductory slide, and then we're going to get into individual uh, the individual disciplines and kind of talk about it, and I'll elaborate on some of this as we go through. So the key to triathlon happiness. So what, what I mean by this is I've been in the sport a long time, and I've observed people that have been in the sport for a long time, and others that have been in the sport for a short period of time and it wasn't sustainable. And this is something that I try to really um, share often because I think it's an important uh, piece of finding triathlon balance, uh, really. And there's a few different things that I'm really just going to encourage you guys to do as you kind of enter the sport. One is you can read about where this person is and this person is and this professional is and this person that's been in the sport for a while. Focus on where you are at this moment. All right? Where... Where am I in my triathlon journey? And make sure your training is really built around that versus what you heard some pro did last week. Uh, make sure that you are building a triathlon schedule that's, that's built around your priorities, your life schedule, your current fitness level. You've got to start there. And if you start to overextend too early, you, you won't last. You, you'll burn out too quickly. Two, maintain, make sure you're maintaining those other priorities in your life. Uh, make sure you, I, I encourage you because you can, this is going to be addictive. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome sport and you want more and more, but you've got to make sure that you're thinking about those other priorities in your life, your family, your work, uh, your friends, and make sure that you're keeping, keeping track of those and make sure they're staying in alignment of those priority systems as you kind of move into this. And then three, enjoy the process. You, we can get very focused on that race. That's our motivator, but it's really what happens between that decision to do your first triathlon and getting to the end that really is where the magic happens and where the real change happens. So enjoy, enjoy the fact that you're getting faster and enjoy the fact that you're probably a happier person and you're, you're just enjoying life a little bit more. Uh, don't, don't get so focused that you don't look around in the middle of a training session and realize that you're riding a bike over a beautiful bridge over the James River enjoying the sunset. It's, it's an awesome sport because you get to live more. 
And so I just encourage you to think about those three things as you go through. Now, I'm, this training period phase, I'm trying to simplify training to, for a beginner. This isn't necessarily how I do it for a more advanced uh, triathlete, but for a beginner, in the most simplest way, these are the different phases that I would think about as you're kind of going through. One, develop your form. Get your technique down. I encourage you, find a coach, have that coach look at you, analyze your form, tell you what you're doing wrong, tell you how to correct it, and get your form down. Because that's your foundation. You've got to have your form down before you take that next step. From there, build some slow endurance. Build your endurance up. If you're doing a sprint distance, try to get up to where you're running three, four miles, even more than the distance of the race. Get that endurance up so you're nice and comfortable. You know you can complete the race. Next step is get fast. So from there, start to add intensity in. Start to do some speed work to actually get faster uh, for race day. And then the fourth would be taper down. Start to slow uh, back off on the volume, actually increase the intensity, increase recovery in between the intensity as you come into that, that race day. So that's the general progression. Now, for someone that is brand new to this, they might develop form, build endurance, and taper. They might just be getting up to the race distance uh, on that time, uh, by, by the time it's, it's race time. And then they come around and they're gonna do another cycle to get to the next one, and now there's more room for some speed work. The other thing is, these don't necessarily happen in, independent of each other. Meaning you're not in phase one, and then you're in phase two. Instead, there's a little bit of a crossover. So we actually recommend as you're, you're building endurance, there's a little bit of speed work in there, developing some foundational speed work as you're building that endurance. And as you start to do more of a get fast phase, there you might be still building a little bit of endurance before the taper. So there's a little bit of a, a crossover in that. And I can speak for two hours on those, I, on those phases, and I have, and so I'm trying to, trying to get the big picture again, but we can get into some of those specifics um, as we need to. And then emphasize recovery. And recovery is where we get faster. It's very important that in between hard sessions, hard workouts, that we have time to recover from those hard workouts. It's very important in between hard blocks. So let's say three weeks of hard work that there's time to recover and let our body rebuild and take a week nice and easy. It's, it's really important that in between really hard years, so you have a hard year, you have some a big chunk of recovery in between that where there's some easier work going, maybe some time off, and then we rebuild. All of this, that recovery is so important. You can't just keep digging yourself into the hole. Let's talk about the different, different phases. So training for swim, really geared towards the beginner again. The percentage of the total amount of time that you're going to swim really depends on your needs and your goals. The swim in most sprint triathlons makes up the least amount of, this, of time. So if you're a proficient swimmer and you can get out of the water safely, and you can get out of the water uh, without being completely spent, then you have extra time in your training, I probably wouldn't spend it on swimming. I would get to the point where you're, you're good, you're comfortable, and you're good with your speed, then I would probably make sure the extra time is spent on biking and running, and then from there, if there's extra time, I'd probably come back to swimming. Again, it's just for total time of that, of that swim. Now, if you fear that you might not survive the swim, then I would spend a lot of time swimming. I would swim a lot, and you need to swim a lot to get better at the swim. It takes time in the water. So that is a need, then I would do it. If you feel like you get out of that water and you are so fatigued, then I would spend a lot of time on the swim. It becomes, even though it's the shortest portion, it becomes crucial for your ultimate triathlon success to spend that time in the swim. 
So it all depends on where you came from. You coming from a swim background, a collegiate swimming background, and you're going into triathlon, and you have that base, I would not swim that much. I would swim it on the bike and the run, and, 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 and get as much time out of that as possible. Nothing replaces the coach's eye on a discipline that is so technique focused. Swimming, you are swimming through a medium that is 833 times thicker than the air. And we have to do that efficiently. Any flaw in your form will make a big difference in your overall swimming. And so it's really important that you learn how to move through the water efficiently as, as humanly possible. Drills are very useful for doing that to a point. They're helpful at the beginning, and they're helpful throughout, but a lot of people spend all their time in the pool swimming drills instead of swimming. And we need to get in the water and we need to actually swim. So what we like to do is we spend a block of time doing lots of drills to really break down the form and get it down in. And then we try to transition into swimming with a focus on those drills and form. We need to swim with a focus on good technique, not swim like this all the way down the pool and never learn how to really apply it. And so drills are useful, but they can be taken too far. If you're going to work on one thing, and you need to, if you are really looking for the biggest gains in swimming, body and head position are the absolute most important thing you can possibly do. So if you're looking for big gains quick, body and head position are the way to do it. Much like that cyclone picture I showed up, if you're swimming, your feet are down here, you're down here, 833 times more thicker than the air, way more important than on a bike, all this surface area is being applied to the water, you are slowing yourself down tremendously. Contrastly, if you have your eyes down, straight down, your body hidden behind your shoulders, feet up at the surface, now, now we're nice and efficient through the water. And we're saving big time on the swim right away. Biggest thing you can do is focus on head and body position. We want to be flat on the water. Much of that is dictated by the head position, making sure it's down and we've got a neutral spine through, putting pressure into the water, which makes those feet pop up. So that's where we spend a lot of time. Once we get that, now we can get into some finer details of the form, specifically rotation, actual kick, propulsion, all that stuff, but it starts with body position first. You can go faster in the swim, way more often than, uh, than you can on the bike and the run. The chance of injury with swimming is lower than on the bike and the run, and you recover a lot quicker because it's not weight bearing. And so you can go faster, and once you have your form down, you should go faster, often, in a lot. It's a very important thing to be able to get fast, but you're focusing on your form the whole time. You never let that focus on your form come off. But it's important, if you want to get faster in the water, once you get your form down, you have to go faster. When you're doing that, choose short, fast reps over long, slow, moderate reps. All right, not slow, but moderate reps. So instead of doing 300s at a comfortably hard pace, break that up and do 650s or 1225s with 15 to 20 seconds reps in between. What you'll find is you'll end up going a lot faster, there's less, you're, you're able to focus better, and your, your form breaks down less, and therefore your overall stroke and speed gets a lot faster. So short, fast reps 
with short reps over long, moderately paced reps, if you want to get faster. And then the last piece is, use strength training to really tie the mind and the muscle, proprioception. To swim well, you need to know where your, where your limbs are. You need to know what your body's doing. So it's one piece of that is knowing how to activate your muscles. Knowing what it feels like to pull from this position. Knowing what it feels like to incorporate your lats. Knowing what it feels like to incorporate your hamstrings on the kit. And so we use strength training to tie the mind with the, with the muscle. It's very important. Okay, bike. Bike. We already talked about this a little bit in the equipment. Biggest thing you can do is really maximize bike fit and, bike, and, and also bike handling skills. So you can build all the fitness in the world and if you go around a corner like this because you're really worried about it, you're never going to be able to use that fitness. If you go down a hill yanking on those brakes the whole way, just really going slow, you're never using your fitness. If you don't know how to climb efficiently, you're not really using your fitness. So it's really important from the beginning that we work on bike handling skills, technique, make sure your fit's really dialed in so that you can really take advantage of the fitness as you're, as you're moving down the road. If you have any extra time in your training, spend it here. The, the, the risk of injury is fairly low. Uh, compared to running, and you, the volume matters with the bike. And this is where you're going to be the majority of the race is on that bike. The biggest gains can really be made here. So if you're looking to not just compete, but actually compete, the bike is where you want to spend any extra time that you have once you kind of check off the essentials. Once you develop your endurance, add speed. Again, Lower level of injury so we can do it a little bit more. Emphasize short, hard efforts initially. So if you're incorporating that speed for the first time, I would focus on like one minute efforts. One minute hard of full recovery in between. Learn how to go hard. Then as we get closer to the race, work at more of a sustained race type intensity. Uh, learn how to take that high, that intensity you learn and draw it out over a longer period of time. Much like my philosophy with focusing on short distance and racing, and then learn how to hold it for longer distances uh, for a half hour man. And then make sure some part of your training you're biking after a swim. And when I say after swim, I mean immediately after swim. Even better, swim, bike, swim, bike, swim, bike, swim, bike, with no rest in between them. Get used to getting off out of that water in finding your legs, which is a, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, so spend some time really working on it. Now this is also an opportunity to really drill transitions, which is extremely important. It's the fourth sport in the sport of triathlon, the fourth discipline of the sport of triathlon. Super important that you spend some time really dominating in those transitions. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And the run, we want to really prioritize technique and form, most importantly, so that you stay injury free. The run is the most weight bearing, it's the greatest chance of injury, and so we need to make sure your form is really dialed in as you kind of come into the sport. Additionally, it's a way to be the most efficient and to be the fastest uh, is with really good form because, because it is weight bearing, we need to be able to move all across that ground as efficiently as possible. I already talked about injury prevention, super important. What we find with runners is the greatest inhibitor to them reaching their success is, is, is that they get hurt and they have to take time off. If you can consistently run, especially consistently run with, with, with speed work and run hard, you will get faster. But it's the injuries that typically will get in the way. Not that that needs to scare you, just it's a way, it's a way you approach your running in terms of taking care of the little things. Make sure that you prioritize strength and prehab work. If you had to pick two things to really work on to really help your running from a strength way, um, from strength wise, would be to really develop your core really well and to really do a lot of hip 
and glute strength work. Because you're standing on one leg and those glutes have to hold you up. They have to keep you stable. And so you'll see with, with our athletes, we have you on one leg a lot, doing a lot of stability and balance work because you're strengthening those hips. Build volume through frequency first. So what I mean by that is don't build volume by doing super long run. Instead, build your volume by doing four smaller runs in a week. Building up to that, and then once you have those longer, I mean those shorter, more frequent runs, then we can increase the overall distance of those runs, especially kind of building up the long run. Limit, limited speed work, this is just we want to be careful with speed work. It doesn't mean you don't do speed work, or huge component of speed work, but you need to, we need to be limited, and we need to make sure that we've built some of that volume before we get into some of the longer speed work efforts. And then run off the bike often. Once again, transitions are super important. We need to make sure that we're, we're running off the bike well, and we learn, learn how to do that. Run off the bike often, and then once you've trained a little bit, run off the bike fast often. Super important. I thought it was the hardest time when I saw Carrie the first time I was like, it's, uh... Yeah, that would be, and, and a lot of people get into the sport, and they're, they're runners, and they're like, well, I don't have to do that. They get in their first race, and it's like, oh my goodness, I've never felt legs like this. It's just, it's just a different feeling. And so, knowing how to do that is super important, and getting your body used to it, and practicing the transition to be able to go through it. Okay, so actual race, so pre-race, it's going to go over... Everything up to the point that we the gun goes off, and then we're going to go through each element of the of the race from there to really give you a full understanding of the the, the whole experience. All right, so we have this thing in triathlon. run. If you've done running races, you're familiar with it too. It's packet pickup. Packet pickup is usually held the day before a race, as well as you can pick up your packet the day of before before the race starts. But you have to be there a little bit earlier. To, to be able to do that. Uh, if you're kind of, if, you, if you're new to this, I recommend going the day before, taking a look at the course, really getting a good sense of it, get your packet, take, get that out of the way, get your bike all set up with your numbers and everything else so that you don't have to worry about that on race day. There's no mystery, it gives you a good chance. If you've done this race 10 times before, uh, then go go the day of, pick up your packet, show up just a little bit earlier. You've done it a million times, slap all your stuff on the on the bike and get out on the course, get going. Save yourself from the, the worry of needing to go the day before. USAT, I should have said USA Triathlon. USA Triathlon is a governing body of triathlon. All almost all races are insured by USA Triathlon. The way that works is that uh, when you're insured by USA Triathlon, everyone that races the race has to have a USA Triathlon license. Um, this is a fairly inexpensive annual, it's like $45, $50, somewhere around there, it changes, <laughs> so I'm not sure what, what it is right now, but uh, around $45, $50. If you're only signing up for one race that year, uh, you're, you're not going to be doing multiple really specifically three races, then you can't get a one-day license, uh, which is, uh, I believe it's $15 now, and that one-day one day license just covers you for that one day. So the advantage of the annual license is that you, if you're doing three races, it's cost-effective, and you can actually get ranked um, in the USA Triathlon database based on your, your results. And so if you want that ranking, you have to be a, an actual annual member. Um, so no, USAT membership is something you need to purchase before you actually register for the race. So when you go into the race registration, it's going to ask for your USAT number. And if you, you can uh, elect right there to get a one day, or you can elect to go ahead and purchase one as part of the registration. It'll kick you over to USAT, you'll purchase it there, and then it'll bring you back to the race website. Um, in the race bag, so, so when you show up and get your packet, they're going to ask to see that the USAT number. So they're going to want to see your license, they're probably going to want to see an ID as well. Um, so you need to bring that to the race, and that's why I put it in here. In your race packet, you're going to get a run number, which I showed you what you do with that, you can see it on your race, race number. 
you're going to get a byte number, which is usually a cohesive number that's going to wrap around here, or you can put it here. So you can put it there, here. If you have room, this is the, the best place for it. It kind of gets out of your way. It's a little bit of a, a, a faster position. But anywhere along here or around there um, does the trick. Um, you're going to get a helmet number. That actually goes on the front of your helmet. Uh, it would stick right on there, and really that's just for pictures. Um, so the photographer wants to be able to see you, and uh, that's, it, that's the main reason, but it is, it is a requirement um, of, the, of the race. So you get your run number, your bike number, your helmet number, and then your swim cap. Usually if it's a pool swim, swim caps they don't always give you. If it's an open water swim, they will give it, because that designates what wave you're going to start in. And so all of the 34 and under men are going to be in a yellow cap. And so they know, they see all those people out there when they're, when they're racing. So that's why, that's why you have a, a specific cap. And they, they usually give that to you. If, um, if you're doing a pool race, I would probably bring a cap if you want to wear a cap. Because you, they might not give you one. Um, race day arrival time. So I usually recommend if you're going to pick up your packet, on the race day, it should show up about uh, two hours before. If you're going to be, uh, you already have your packet, and all you have to do is kind of get in, set up, and go, about an hour and a half before. Now, if it's your first time, you want to show up a little bit earlier, to kind of get your bearings, uh, then, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, they, they might not be ready for you, <laughs> it might still be dark, but, uh, but you're welcome to kind of show up, wait in the car for the lights to come on, and different things like that. Um, timing chip. Well, they will not give you a timing chip the day before. So if you go to pack and pick up, they're not going to give you a timing chip as part of this. This is a ankle strap. Got one over here. And they um, used to have to buy these ankle straps. Now they, they tend to give them to you and then you give them back at the end. Uh, but you just strap uh, the, the chip on there and you're going to put this around your left ankle like this. And that's going to keep track of you during, during the whole race. I recommend if you can, if you are wearing a wetsuit, put the wetsuit over top of that. It keeps it on a little bit better. Plus, if you take the wetsuit off, you don't have to go over top of that chip. Uh, which can kind of snag it. Um, getting that wetsuit off is, is an important piece of moving quickly through, through your transition. So just put that wetsuit over. Um, and then body markings. So once you get your timing chip, you're going to go usually in transition or just outside of transition, they're going to body mark you. They're going to put your number here, they're, they're going to put your number here, they're going to put your number here or here, and then they're going to write your age so that your competition knows to hunt you down um, on your on your cap. <laughs> so that's a typical, typical of spicing, but every one's a little bit different, but that's, that's typically where they're going to <laughs> sort of. So, so it's so uh, for um, for penalties and different things when uh, when you're when uh, when you're out on the, the bike or on the swim, so they know what number you are. But it's also a safety safety issue as well. Um, so they can they know who you are if, you, if something happens. Um, and then setting up transition. Um, stand up for me real quick. Go on. So. Big thing, now again, I could talk for two hours on this, but I won't. Uh, the big thing with transition is to keep it really simple and to pretend you have short term memory loss. Those are the two things that I always remind you. Because when you get in the excitement of the race, you are going to forget things. And so we want to make it so easy that you can't possibly forget it. So, first off, if you're wearing, you're wearing running shoes on the bike in the run, all you're going to do here is you're going to put your running shoes here. I would go ahead and put your race belt right there, and you're going to put your, your, your helmet right on top of it, not backwards, and definitely not close in here, right here. If you put it here, you're going to go like this. I guarantee you. I'm going to put it like this, just like you're coming in. All right? Very simple. Everything's right there. So we come in from the swim. We're going to put our helmet on. We're going to put our shoes on. We're going to go ahead and put our race belt on and we're going to spin it around the back so the numbers on our back. Make sense? Then we're going to take our bike, we're going to run it out to the mountain line, 
about it just a little bit, and we're going to start the fight. Very simple. Now, let's say you have cycling shoes now. We're going to put those right behind you. We're going to put the bike on, I mean the helmet, we're going to put the helmet on top of the cycling shoes, and then we're going to have our running gear. And you don't need that race number until the run. The only reason I had you do it before is because there's nothing else there to remind you to come and get that after the bike if you've already put your running shoes on. But if your running shoes are still here, you can leave it there. You'll remember. So here, we're going to come we're going to put our helmet on, we're going to put our cycling shoes on, we're going to go, we're going to come back, we're going to take off our helmet, we're going to take off our cycling shoes, we're going to put on our running shoes, we're going to grab the race belt, and we're going to run with it and put it on as we go. Simple. Third stage, to get even faster, you can eventually learn how to get into your shoes while you're riding. And we teach all of our athletes this. It's really not that hard to do. It can be intimidating at the beginning, but it's really not that hard to do. So this setup, we would have it like this. You'll see I have number 10 rubber bands over there. You would take those rubber bands, and you would wrap it around here and around this to hold your shoe up. They're very thin, so they break. Number 10 is key. And then, same thing here around the rear skewer. Now, with this setup, I would put my helmet up here or up here so that everything's on my bike. My run's down there, my bike's up here. Very simple. I'm going to run in. The only thing I have to do is put my helmet on, snap it, and then I'm running out of transition. It's the only thing. I'm here for like five seconds at most. Put my helmet on, I'm going. Then, as I'm riding, I'm getting in my shoes. Before I get back, I'm getting out of my shoes. Getting out of my shoes, stepping on the top, pedaling, pedaling in, come back to the dismount line, I'm going to hop off before I get that dismount line, I'm going to run back in, put my running shoes on, grab my race belt, and I'm running out while I, while I strap that on. So, a few different stages again. Most beginner, have your second shoes on the ground would be kind of the next step. And then learning how to do what's called a flying mount, flying dismount, would be the third step. Cool. All very doable, all very teachable. Teach tons of people to do it every year. Alright, so that's transition. Very simple. Again, I can go over that. And we do a lot of private sessions, so if you guys ever want to just go work on that, as our group program, if you're involved in our group program, we'll be practicing that over and over and over before race day. But um, that's something that, that, that we work with people on all the time. So, you go in, set up transition. All right, I went into the, the race how to. Uh, but with setting up transition, it really shouldn't take that long. Now, you'll see most beginners. Will we'll come in here and they will a yard sale kind of going on in here. It's, it's a lot of stuff, you know, tons of keep it simple. Just keep it simple. It's going to be so much easier. If you have a lot of other stuff, it confuses you when you're in there. Um, you will see I, I laid down this towel. You can take, take a little uh, half a towel, uh, half a deep shower is the size you get, and you lay that down. You really don't need to. Really dry your shoes too much. What I typically do is just kind of wipe them off on the top of the other foot and then stick it on. Very simple. The you'll notice that I don't have socks here. That's a personal preference. If you blister a line and you're worried about that, you're welcome to put socks on. I would try not to bite the socks, um, and I then I would try to leave them for the run. There are race distances where I'll use socks, like the Ironman. But um, for the most part, I train without socks so that I don't need them on race day. Um, and so, just a faster thing, kind of move through. I spend a lot of time getting, getting faster on the swim bike and run. I'm not going to waste it sitting here in transition. And so, it's just, just trying to try to get that speed. Um, there's something else I was going to say there, but I think I forgot it. So, I'll probably think of it in just a little bit. Warm up. So if you are comfortable with the with the distance, you're comfortable with the race distance, I do recommend a warm up. 
Typically, the, the order in which we, we recommend someone warm up is to do an easy run with maybe a couple little short kind of strides, pickups at the end, just kind of open up the legs in there. Then a easy bike with a little bit of a stronger kind of race pace effort, like a three minute effort. Someone more advanced might do like a couple or a few three minute efforts in there, kind of open up the legs a little bit again, and then get in the water and swim. That's the part that no one wants to warm up in, and it's because they're intimidated by the swim, which is exactly the reason you need to get in the water and swim. Get in there early, spend a lot of time in the water, get relaxed, float in the water a little bit, swim a little bit in the water, do a little bit of speed, like fast sections, just to kind of get comfortable, get all the nerves out. The warm up is all part psychological, part mental, and part, part physiological. We just got to kind of get, get ourselves comfortable. Okay? So I recommend a warm up, but. If you're not comfortable with the distance, I would probably just do some dynamic exercises, some dynamic movements on the deck, maybe bring some bands, and just kind of go through the motions, kind of warm up your muscles, and then go right into the race. You can get by with that. The number one thing physiological about a warm up is you just need to raise your core body temperature. You need to find some way to do that. You can do that through some stuff without a lot of endurance space. Okay, let's break into the swim. So, there are a few different swim formats, all right? There's a snake swim, which is typically used, oh, I'm sorry, this is for the pool. So in the pool, there's a couple different formats. The snake swim is typically used. So say nine out of 10 times, you're gonna see a snake swim in a pool swim. And typically what, what this means is that you've got, this is a way of getting a lot of people through a swim quickly. So you've got lanes, right? One person is going to start here, and they're going to finish here. They're going to swim down that. They're going to push off this wall, either a flip turn or an open turn, and they're going to come out under the lane line. Then they're going to swim down that, and then push off under the lane line. And when they get here, they get out of the water. So we typically have a six lane pool, so you're making 12 lanes, so you get a 300 meter swim. We are very unique in Richmond, and we also have um, the swim RBA facility, and they have a big 50 meter pool, right? And the RTC Sprint Triathlon actually uses an open water format, where they have this little line that comes down here, and they have a buoy. And then they have a line that comes down here, and they have a boot. And it's not a lane line, it's a little thin little line. So they'll put like eight people in here behind a barrier, in a little boot, and you're floating in the water, and they say go, and all eight people take off, and they swim this course, which is in a snake pattern, but they're actually going around the movies, and they get out down here. So open water is a simulated open water, but in a pool situation, you really need a 50 meter pool to be able to do that. So you get a 400 meter swim out of that. It's a really fun, fun race. It's one of the most fun races in the round. Um, with the snake swim, I encourage people to swim in even, controlled, not go out too fast. In an open water swim, um, swim situation like this, you need to get to this as fast as possible because then you'll get bottlenecked. So I actually encourage you to swim in uneven and swim in the beginning faster and then settle in once you get around that first movie. Again, if you're not comfortable in that situation, you're 25 as a beginner. It's kind of just start in the back and let everyone go. No one's forcing you to go. Um, that's just the general strategy. Again, if you're a swimmer, come from a swim background and you want to get the most out of it. You're actually not. You're floating um, in the water. One thing that a lot of people make the mistake of doing is they bob vertically. What we really recommend people do is a float horizontally because when you go from here to here, a lot of times it messes with your head a little bit, you get dizzy. Plus it's just slower because you've got to go like this when the gun goes off. So you float. I encourage people to put their head in and kind of go into a relaxed state 
and then when the gun goes off, then you have to pull right from there. Uh, with the snake swim, snake swim, either they have you jump in and hold up the wall with like 10 seconds to go, and then you push off and get the countdown, or the new thing is they'll put a mat on the start mat up on the deck, and you run, and you don't run. They don't want you to do that. <laughs> you, you walk across the mat and then you jump in the water and you can't dive. Jump in the water and then you go. Secret that, you jump as far as you possibly can. Hit the ground and push off as hard as you can. You can go. Alright. So that's that. Open water format. So there's a couple different um, formats of open water. Typically you'll see a mass or a wave start, which is really the same thing. Either they start the whole race together or they're going to start you in waves about three to five minutes apart. Uh, but you're starting with up, or up, up to 150 feet is uh, the most they can, they can put in a mass, uh, ma or a, uh, a wave start. Um, the other format, uh, which you'll really only see in, there's some Ironman and uh, half Ironman races, is a time trial start. And they send you either in a group of three or one at a time. Like every five seconds, and you go and complete the course, and you got you kind of got that you just, your starting time. That's when it starts, kind of like snake swim uh, format. With the mass wave start, I would if you're going for speed, I would start out fast, get with a faster group over the first fifty, and then find someone to draft because the draft makes a big big difference. Uh, in, in swimming. We talked about that for a long time as well. The, um, if you were doing the time trial start, I would, I would try to swim a nice even pace as best you can. And as you pass people, try to get as close to them and take advantage of the draft as you kind of go by. If anyone pass you, you can jump on as well. Um, the, uh, in the open water, um, not a time trial start, but a mass start, there's typically two types of starts. It's a beach start where you're starting up on the beach, um, in either ankle deep or literally on the beach, and you're like 20 yards from the water. And they say go, and you run. And you want to run as far as you possibly can before you get tripped up by the water. So you want to try to run as far as you can. And once you get tripped up, dive as far as you can. And then if it's still shallow, you can do something called dolphin diving, where you actually reach down and grab the bottom. You push off the bottom and go into another dive. You reach out and grab, and you. There will be races where, because it's faster than swimming, you'll do that for a very, for an intelligence need. And these are races where it's shallow for a while. Um, if it's a in water start, I would start just like I talked about up here, where you're horizontal, waiting at the line, kind of floating, stalling with your hands, and then they say go and you go. Um, choosing your start position. If you are really intimidated by a swim, line up on the outside and in the back. You can let them all go and then you can kind of swim through and get comfortable. Um, if you want to be really aggressive, you want the straightest line to that first buoy as possible. Um, you, and you want to be kind of in the mix with, with everyone. Or at least, still okay to kind of go on the outside, depends on the race, but you want to have a nice straight line to that, to that spot. Um, Wetsuit, we talked about that earlier, not much else to go over that. If you need assistance at any time in an open water swim, roll over on your back and, and, and float, get comfortable, and this is typically the, the signal you need help, but I would just yell, yell too, and let people know. Now, I put this on here, one, for that reason, and two, um, the rule is if a boat comes over to you and you grab onto that boat, you're not disqualified as long as that boat doesn't carry you anywhere. So if you need a break, grab onto the boat, relax, kind of get your bearings straight, take deep breaths, relax, and then you can restart no problem. It's when that boat starts to paddle, you do the shore, you get into the boat, you can't hop on your bike again. Uh, you would be disqualified. Okay, the bike. So, Really important, I encourage you to get, get, get familiar with the course. Go ahead and drive it the day before when you go get your packet. Get a good feeling for what, what, what it's like. Understand uh, the kind of nooks and crannies of the, of the course and, and know it. You, once in a while, 
will get sent the wrong way by a volunteer. And the race director is going to tell you it's your responsibility to know the course. So if you know the course goes straight and that volunteer is telling you to go right, you go straight and you trust, trust your gut. Um, but um, yeah, obviously that, that takes a little bit of really knowing the course and really, really going over it. The, we talked about the noun the dismount line. Essentially what this is, is, it's a line coming out of transition that separates transition from the bike course. You can't ride your bike in transition. You have to cross that line and then you can get on your bike. If you get on your bike before it, it's a penalty. They actually give you a time infraction. Once you're out on the bike, you're going to come back, you're going to meet your dismount line. You have to get your foot down, one foot down before that line. If you cross it and put your foot on the other side, again, it's a time penalty. Uh, so it's just really important to find those. You're usually like right neon lines uh, or they're spray painted on the, on the road. Uh, know if there's vehicles on the road. Most courses, almost all of them, have vehicles on the road. Except for the East Coast Triathlon uh, Festival Super Threat. We have a completely closed course that's on a loop course um, for a variety of different reasons, but one is we want it to be nice and beginner friendly. Um, drafting, passing, and blocking. You um, will likely be passed and or pass people. There are some rules with that, and it's really the main rule on the bike. So essentially, you have um, you are supposed to be behind someone three bike lengths. That's the easy way to remember. It's about three bike lengths. Right, so if someone's here, we have to be, that's a lot more than three bike lengths, but we have to be three bike lengths behind them at all times. If you enter the draft zone, you can ride right up on them. But when you go, you have 15 seconds from when you go into that draft zone to get around them and in front of them. Meaning, you can't go here, and then 30 seconds later decide to go around. Also, you can't go here and sit here and race them for a while um, beside them because, again, you're there too long and that's how you're blocking. So, what I tell people is, if you're going to go around someone, make sure you can pass them and get by them with some, some oomph. Now, if you're this guy and you just got passed, So you got someone up here, this guy can't be passed right now. He has to drop out of the, the draft zone, and then he can re-enter. But he has to drop out before he goes. Now very rarely is an official going to have a stopwatch right, on you, like, looking at it. So like, 15 seconds, you're not going to look at your watch. Just kind of be smart about it. Kind of work around it as quickly as, quickly as you can. But there are officials who are on motorcycles, and they roam the course, and this is exactly what they're looking for. If no one's around you, you still need to be over to the right-hand side of the road. If you're over near the center line, it's called blocking. You're blocking anyone from going around you, because someone would have to go around you on the right side, which is illegal for them. So that's drafting, passing, and blocking. Um, a lot of people say warn the person when you're coming around them. I typically don't, because what I find is when I warn them, they always go the opposite direction that I want them to. So, like, I'll say on your left, and they go left. And so I usually just kind of slide by, and uh, it works, works a little bit better. Use your gears. Have a lot of gears on the bike. Use them. Learn how to use them. Get great at using those gears. Stay low if you're on a road bike, air bike. Uh, try bike, whatever, get as low as you can. We want to take advantage of those aerodynamics, and your body position makes most of the difference. And then, as you come into the last few minutes, there's a few things you can do, and I didn't talk about this in the swim, but I'll, I'll spit, talk about it now. As we come into the end of the swim, we want to prepare for the bike. We do that because by trying to get the oxygen, the blood that's carrying all that oxygen that's up in our arms, because those are our working arms, get up all legs. So we're going to do that by kicking more in the last few minutes of the swim. As you get um, ready for the run, coming off the bike, a couple things. Stand up, get in more of a running position. Stand up a couple times, put in a harder gear, and get more in the running position. Then set back down and spin at a higher cadence. This will start to flush your legs out, 
and get you more prepared for that run. So those two things I would do as you kind of come into the run, you'll find you'll start your run a lot better if you follow those tips coming in the video. Now the run. Um, again, preview, study the course. This is where people are typically set the wrong way. The run is where you really want to go. First three to five minutes are going to be the hardest part of your run, typically. All right? The most important thing in those first three to five minutes is to stay calm. Relax. Dude, you want to go like this? Breathe. Just relax. Know that your legs are going to not feel great. You just got off of a hard bike in the hard swim. Just give yourself time. Relax and let yourself find the rhythm. Focus on your form and focus on turnover. Focus on a faster cadence and being quick with your feet versus muscling it and really reaching out for the road. Quick turnover, quick form, deep breaths. And everything will kind of start to flow and come together really quickly. The more you practice, the better you get. Encourage someone else. This really goes to the whole race. Encourage someone else, I guarantee you'll go faster. Say some kind of encouraging word to that other person that's out of the course. You'll find everyone else is doing it as well. It's the beauty of triathlon. You'll have the top pro, pro athlete in the, in the race encouraging the age grouper as, as he's running by, uh, going the opposite direction, or waiting at the, at the, the finish line. It's the spirit of triathlon. It's a great, great, awesome thing. Um, headphones, as well as uh, headphones are illegal in, in running in, uh, in triathlon, and having a pacer on the course, meaning someone, which is pretty tip, both of those are kind of typical in running, but having someone out on the course who's going to run alongside you uh, is, is illegal. With that said, um, most beginner friendly triathlons that it's not a, like a professional race are not going to really care if your friend comes out there and runs with you. It, it, they probably care if you're with the race, but not, not if you're kind of just trying to get through it. It's perfectly, uh, usually fine. You might want to ask um, the race director just to make sure. And then make sure you have the race number uh, on the front at all times, but specifically when you get to that finish line. Um, you, need that, you need that race number on the front because that's how they're double checking your, your timing chip. Um, so it's important for the race director and they can give you a penalty for that. All right, two more slides. I know we are, we are we're, I didn't say how long this is going to take, but it's taken a while. So, uh, nutrition, all right, some things to think about. So, the week of race, eat like you normally should, but don't. <laughs> eat healthy. Eat like you're, you're taking in fuel. Eat like uh, it's, it's, it's a fuel that your body's going to run off of, because it is. If you think that way, everything that we can race would be great, but try not to change too many things. We want to keep it as normal as possible. Two nights, um, two nights before is your night to carb load. Most people have big pasta dinner the night before, and this is the last time you, you do not want to do that. Do it two nights before, eat a little bit more heavier carbohydrates, that'll give it time to kind of work through and not leave you the next morning feeling really good. Alright, so carb loading, taking in some more carbohydrates two nights before. Minimize your fiber from this point on and make sure you're hydrating well. The day before, we're looking for small carbohydrate based meals with a little bit higher sodium intake. So things like just salting your food a little bit more, munching on healthy chips or crackers, these are good ideas the day before, before a race. Sodium is important to your electrolyte um, balance, and it's impo uh, therefore important for your um, preventing uh, muscle cramps and just performing optimally. We, we need that. We need sodium, potassium, on different electrolytes in there. So, good thing the day the day before. Make sure we're looking for a little bit more of that. Race morning, if if, if you can do it, get up and have a good solid breakfast, like. 500, 750 calorie breakfast, like three hours before. You gotta practice this a little bit. But get up and have a good, strong breakfast and then let it kind of clear out. And then start drinking water, and just kind of sip water. We don't want to overhydrate, but we want to want to be drinking. An hour before, not a lot of people do this. You had a good breakfast, you don't have to do it, but I really like to have some kind of snack at that point. So an hour before, I'll have a bar, some kind of sports bar. 
um, then I could eat in the middle of the race. So an hour before should be perfectly fine. Um, I would I also highly recommend for at this point switching from water over to a good quality sports drink. Something that's built for endurance, like Scratch Labs or Gatorade Endurance, uh, any of those, there's tons of, of different options out there. But this is a time where you need to be focused on calories and you need to be focused on uh, electrolyte balance. And so from this point through about an hour after the race, it should really be sports training from that point. In, in the race, uh, the swim, you don't really have to worry about nutrition. Um, the only time I would consider it would be an Iron Man, and that would be like a gel stuck in your in your wetsuit. You can maybe take that out if you were going to be out there on the swim for a very long time. But you were worried about being cut off, that would be a good idea, just so you don't go into a bike and you have to The the bike, uh, I would um, if for like a sprint race, probably be just fine with just a sports strength. You do a sports drink, you can be able to get through um, that race and it's fueling your, your, your carbohydrate needs just fine, your electrolyte needs. You might want to gel if you're someone that kind of feels like you're going to be out there a little bit longer and would like a little bit more calories on, on the bike. Um, be careful about taking those five minutes into the bike uh, because you've got a lot of blood moving in your body which isn't there for digestion because it's trying to get to the working muscles to fuel the effort. And so I would not take in anything in that first five minutes. I absolutely would not take anything in in transition. It's a typical beginner mistake of actually drinking in transition. Leave it until about five minutes into the bike. And then as you get to the five minutes left in the bike, I wouldn't touch, uh, touch much nutrition at that point either, as well as five minutes into the run. Let, let yourself kind of settle. Stomach takes a lot more jostling on the run. And so I want to kind of get settled and, and, and get that, get used to that before we before we start taking the nutrition. Um, on the run, it's really preference. So if you're gonna kind of get through that run pretty quickly, most of your fueling is probably already taking place. It's not gonna make much difference over a sprint distance. Sprint distance I'm talking, then you can probably go through and not even touch the station. Um, you could grab a sports drink if you're kind of feeling thirsty, then, then go for it. If you don't feel like your stomach can take it, there's a little mental trick. You can put a sports drink into your mouth and slosh it around your mouth and spit it out, and your brain tells your body that, that, that the fluids are coming, and it actually will make you feel more hydrated. Uh, another little little thing to think about on the run if your stomach just can't, can't handle it. Um, and then, uh, and then post-race, very important. It's very important to get some kind of calories in, uh, a mix of protein and carbohydrate. I like a ratio of four uh, parts carbohydrate to one part uh, protein, as well as a good amount of, of electrolytes. In that, uh, in that 30, ideally 15 minutes after the workout, your cells are opened up really wide, and they, they're ready to take the nutrition and they close slowly throughout the hour. And so you want to get that nutrition in right after that workout, very important. Then, take that in instantly, and then about an hour after, I get a good quality meal in. Uh, get a good, you know, high-value uh, high uh, calories in that, in, in, around that hour after. Good protein, good carbohydrate, good vitamins, salad, chicken salad, uh, with some, some rice on it, you know, that would be great, something like that. And then just keep eating and hydrating throughout the day. All right. Last slide. So, parting thoughts. A few things to think about. Travel is an amazing journey. I fully encourage you to look at it as something that's going to impact your life. That it's going to make you a better person, a better husband, a better wife, a better son, a better, better co-worker, a better friend. It, it has the impact of doing that if you, if you approach it that way. And so, I encourage you to think, think through that and be excited about the journey that you're going to embark on. And appreciate more than that race day. Think about that process. Appreciate what you're able to do on a daily basis. You're able to do something that very few people can. And that, that's, a, that's, that's awesome. In this sport, it's not like a lot of sports where you have a competition every week. 
a lot of times you're kind of building up to a big race, especially when it's when it's your first time. That's a big day. You put a lot of stock in that day, but things can happen. Things can happen. There's, you know, there's mechanics uh, that, that that's part of this. You know, you can get sick. So don't you know, put a value in it, but also don't let that diminish the value of the training. Because even if something happens and you can't compete that day, your life's better because of, of kind of getting ready for that race and going through that process anyway. Um, I, I believe this sport and your motivation and your ability to perform is way better when you have some friends to do it with or a team or a training group to, to, to train alongside. So uh, I, that's not just a bias comment. <laughs> it's something that I've really found. There's research uh, behind it. It's something that I adopt myself as an athlete. So I encourage, I encourage you to find a group to train with, find a coach that knows what they're doing that can save you a lot of time and effort and injury uh, to kind of get through this process together. Uh, after the race, stick around and enjoy the finish line. It's really awesome to watch the type of people come across that finish line and the excitement that, that happens at that finish line. Encourage others, sit there and cheer them on. Uh, that, that's the, the beauty of the, the sport of triathlon. And then go sign up for another one. Uh, because uh, you're going you're gonna to love it and you're going to want to go and, uh, and do another one. I'm, I'm, I'm confident in it's, it's something that uh, people really fall in love with, and I'm excited for y'all y'all to do that. So, with that said, that's, that's all I've got. I'm trying to try to give you as much information as I can, like I said. If there's anything specific that I can answer now, or you're looking for some more information, uh, I'd love, uh, love to, to have you just reach out to me after this. I think, did, did everyone um, RSVP for this? Do I have all your emails? Got my Got yours, don't have yours. Let me get yours. I can send you this presentation. Um, and that way, you've also got my email. And if you, you need anything else, um, let me know. Let me uh, grab, in, uh, grab in a piece of paper and a pen. Let me just get everyone to write their name down. And if, if I don't have an email, I'll just write email down. That's where I can cross check it. Um, any questions now that I can answer? Anything I can help with? We do, absolutely. So we have we have two things. We have year-round adult and youth training. You know, with the youth training, but with adult training, we have um, practices pretty much every day of the week. Um, the The beauty of the way we do things is we pair every single person with um, an individual coach. So that individual coach is your coach who oversees all of your training. Now, with that, you also have uh, have a training plan that that coach builds and lays out all of your all of your training. So you go online, you know exactly what you need to do um, for that day. Depending on what uh, depending on which level of coaching you choose, that coach will look at that that training on a, up to a daily basis. So after the workout, you'll load feedback in and. They'll review that feedback, they'll look at the files, they'll get their professional coach analysis of it, and they'll write you a note on a daily basis so that you know what to do next and, and how, how you did with that, with that. But additionally, you also have access to our 15 plus practices a week. And so you can come to uh, all of our different sessions, swim, bike, run, um, run sessions, and we have, um, we have a partnership with Caluso Open Water. So if you're familiar with that, if you're involved in our program, you get free access to Caluso Open Water, and you also have free access to the Swim Army facility, um, as well as our facility and a discount in our shop. So all kinds of benefits there. Now, we also have a beginner training team that we're coming, that's coming up, and that starts March 5th, so a month from today. And that's going to prepare for the RTC Sprint Triathlon. And that uh, consists of two practices a week, as well as a training plan. And you have a point, uh, a point of contact um, with one of our coaches. And so that's going to practice Tuesday evenings will be the swim. And then Saturday, Wait, it's actually at St. Catharines. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that seems like a long way Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's not as bad as you think it is. Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, Tuesday evening swim and then the Saturday afternoon bike and run. Um, and then you follow the training plan for the other sessions. And it's our, we've done several beginner programs. We got that exact one last year and it was just a great success. We got a great group of people that got introduced to the sport and a lot of bonding and camaraderie that kind of came out of it. it was and really is that all adults? It's all adults. Yeah, oh, that, that one's all adults. We have had um, teeny, we had a father-son duo that participated in that last year, if I remember correctly, um, that uh, was like a teenager. Um, and uh, not a deal for her. Not deal for her. Um, yeah, so that's our beginner triathlon program. So we have our, our, our year-round kind of coaching program that you can start and stop at any time. And then we have a, a one-time thing. We're also going to have a beginner triathlon. We haven't announced this, but a beginner triathlon program for um, the Pink Power Triathlon as well, um, which will start up. It's like four weeks after the RTC Spring ends. Any other questions? Like 